When my dad first told me this story as a kid, it really gave me the chills. And since I stumbled upon this sub, I might as well share it. I still remember every detail. Before going into the details, I'll give some context to set the setting and background of the incident. Bear with me, they totally add up to scary elements to the story. Back in 1985, my 19-year-old dad was serving in the Greek Army Special Forces in the Paratrooper Division. Army service in Greece is mandatory for every male that's reached their 18th birthday, and so everyone has to go. Military camps where each company is stationed at are mostly positioned in the countryside, and usually there isn't much going on near and around the camp. They're fairly secluded. The closest town to my pop's camp was three kilometers away. One night while serving, it was my dad's turn to go on guard duty in the camp he was posted in. Every night, five to six soldiers were selected for guard duty, and they slept in the same barracks. Half an hour before it was time for the previous guards to be relieved, another soldier would come in the room, wake up the new batch so they could get ready, and then go to their positions. Each shift was two hours. The 12 to 6 a.m. shifts were the worst, according to my pops. It gets extremely cold in the winter, and you're half asleep standing beside your booth, freezing your butt off while keeping watch. The only way to be vigilant and keep warm is for you to take a few steps up and down. So it was 2 a.m., and my dad was standing next to his booth with his rifle. Absolute silence. He could only hear the wind. He mentioned that the moon was helpful with visibility, but there's so much that you can't make out at night, even with the moon apart from dark shadows, especially at longer distances. There were some tree lines far away, but there wasn't much vegetation around the camp at all. It was more like a clearing. Everything's going well like every other night, until a tall, dark mass appears from the path coming out of the tree line and it's headed right towards my father's booth. My dad's heart stops pumping when he spots it, and he says he's scared shitless at this point. The mass moves slow but steady, and is closing the distance, almost like floating with big, slow steps. My dad does what he's instructed to do, and what every guard does in a situation like this. Raises his rifle, aims and screams. Halt! Identify yourself! No reply. The shadow continues to approach. Second time. Halt! Identify yourself! Again. Nothing. He told me that at this point he was certain that he sees a ghost in real life. He says that he then thought to himself, Let's see if a ghost can die. Before he engages, he has to scream a code word that raises the alarm. The way that works is the next guard on the next booth that is hundreds of meters away will hear the scream, then screams himself, and with a chain reaction like that, the alarm goes from booth to booth and reaches the patrol. Now, the patrol is an officer with five soldiers that make the rounds between booths every night, and they make sure everything's okay with the guards. If you're caught sleeping or you're away from your post by these guys, rest in peace. They're also the ones to investigate an alarm. The only problem is the patrol might take a while to get to the booth that raised the alarm, as they don't know which one it is, and they might be far from the right one. They run double time through every booth until they finally locate the original source of alarm. My dad hears the other guy screaming, and he knows the alarm is raised. He knows that the patrol is going to be there in a few minutes. He also knows that the penalty for falsely raising the alarm is prison. Prison means a soldier gets X amount of days added to their service. The service back then was two years plus prison days that have been added to a soldier along the way from penalties. They don't actually lock you up in a cell unless you commit an actual crime, then the military police comes in. But he doesn't have minutes. The eerie figure is 50 meters away and closing. He gets ready to fire. Then he hears, Relax. And he says my dad's last name. It's me. Another soldier covered in a black blanket that my dad knew was trying to sneak back into the camp that night after having fun in the nearest town without permission. 
He was holding a bottle of liquor too and was fairly drunk. My dad let him through, but he knew he was about to get a serious amount of prison time for falsely raising the alarm once the patrol figured out it was his booth that the alarm was raised from. The patrol gets there. My dad doesn't snitch on the drunk guy. The officer then tells them they'll see each other in the next morning. It's the next day in line where the penalties are being announced by the officers and my dad's waiting to hear his name called, but they never even mention him. Even though an alarm raise is extremely rare to happen, nobody tells him anything. Turns out the patrol officer and the ghost were buddies. The guy sneaking in told the lieutenant what happened and did not mention my dad. The officer apparently pulled some strings and the whole incident was like it never even happened. So yeah, there was a happy end after all. This happened a couple of years back when I was around 14 to 15 years old. There was a mostly abandoned peninsula in our town that I often visited with my dog when I was younger. I even got lost a couple of times and had to swim across parts of the river to get back home. It was always deserted and you could walk for hours without running into anyone. My mom was always very against me going there, but of course I thought I knew better and I went anyway, even though she specifically forbade me. One time I decided to go with one of my girlfriends from school and her two little dogs. It was empty as usual, and we went to the store so that we could play with the dogs in the river. As we started playing, we noticed an older man maybe in his mid-fifties that was walking nearby behind the trees. He stopped pretty close and had just stared at us for a couple of minutes with an expressionless face without even saying a word. At this point, we started to feel a little uncomfortable. Then we noticed that he started taking off his clothes. The whole situation was really off-putting since the whole peninsula was pretty much fully abandoned and he could have easily chose any other location to bathe. We should probably have left at this point but we were really having fun with the dogs and we weren't quite ready to go home yet. We decided to leave the beach to go a bit further to find another location where we could be alone. As we were leaving, I looked back and I saw the man staring at us in the same unsettling way. I couldn't see that well, but at this point I could see that he was fully naked. He didn't follow us though, and I just convinced myself then he was probably just some innocent nudist. We walked for maybe five or ten more minutes until we found a new area to go into the water. We waited a bit, and there was no sign of the man, so we started playing with the dogs yet again in the water. We spent maybe an hour or so there, and to be honest, I had completely forgotten all about the guy at this point. Then suddenly my friend walks up to me with a pale face and then says, We need to leave right now. Don't turn around. And of course I turn around, and there he was. The same man standing right behind us fully naked, masturbating while watching us with the same creepy expressionless face. We got the dogs and then walked away as fast as we could. We have no idea how long he was there lurking in the bushes and just watching us. Needless to say, I never went back there alone after that. Many years have passed and I've heard multiple stories of creepy encounters from different people on that peninsula. It's scary to think what could have happened one day when I was just wandering there all alone. The peninsula was mostly covered with a dense forest and it could have taken very little effort for a grown ass man to drag me into the bushes. I'm so glad that didn't happen. My parents had purchased a condo about 10 minutes away from their home around the time my older brother was born, with the intention that my siblings and I have the option of renting it when we would come of age. I moved in alongside my brother a few weeks after my 18th birthday, exhilarated by the freedom from our childhood home, which had become plagued with traumatic memories over the years. The move took two or three days, and we had a U-Haul coming in and out of the driveway during that time. My first day of college occurred a few days later. I had a full schedule three days a week with my last class getting out at 6pm, which I would later regret. 
The city I live in is notorious for heavy traffic, and I wouldn't get home until roughly an hour and a half later, despite the university being less than 15 miles away. The sun was mostly down by the time I turned into my street, and there were a few people, some accompanied, and one alone taking their evening strolls. There wasn't really anything remarkable about it. The driveway was occupied, so I parked on the street, and I made my way home. The following day, I got off my closing shift at 9 p.m. It was pretty dark by the time I got home, and there was a man walking on the strip of the sidewalk that faces the condo. I wouldn't have noticed that he was the lone man from the evening before if it wasn't for him wearing the same outfit. A bright yellow hoodie, black nylon track pants with white pinstripes, gray Nike trainers, and a tan baseball cap. As I got out of my car, we shared a quick glance and continued on our ways. Two days later, I got off my closing shift and I had picked up my boyfriend for a date. We went back to the condo so that I could change, and in the dark, I saw that same man again, wearing the same outfit and on the same strip of sidewalk. It's him again! I sounded more surprised than sussed out, and my boyfriend was confused. I explained that I had been seeing him walking around and that he was always wearing the same thing. We got out of the car and just stared at him. Our bodies turned toward him and he had ducked behind a car. Now properly sussed out, we got back in my car and we watched him get into his and then drive away with his lights off. It was too dark and he was too far away for us to catch a license plate. At this point, I wasn't even sure if this man even lived in the neighborhood. We went about our night, and I dropped my boyfriend back off at his parents' house. He told me to call him and or the police if I happened to see that same man yet again, and I agreed. I got home around midnight. The man was a street away from his usual spot, crouching below a tree and hugging his knees under his chin. I drove past him and I noticed a different man in a blue flannel and jeans approaching a street light. He got under the illuminating glow and pulled his phone out, attempting to make a phone call. I was honestly unsure if the two men had any association with each other until I looked back over at the yellow hoodie man. He was no longer under the tree. He was also under the street light, just a few meters away from the tree. His bag turned to me but it appeared as though he was taking a call. As I looked back and forth between the two men, it became pretty obvious that they were communicating with each other. I then drove away and called the police. They told me to stay where I was or go to another safe location and that they would contact me when the matter was taken care of. I dozed off and I was awoken maybe an hour or so later by the promised phone call. I was told that neither of the two men were residents of the area, and they were simply told not to come back on reports of suspicious activity. After being advised to call again if they came back, I went home. I was tired enough that I had no trouble sleeping for quite a while. Right at around 4am, I was sharply roused by the metal screen door rattling against its frame. The force slowly grew in intensity, and eventually, the walls and floor were now quaking. I peeked through the blinds of my second story window which overlooks the front door, and of course, I saw the man in the yellow hoodie aggressively attempting to open the screen door. I was shaking in my boots on my mattress, which was still on the floor, as I hadn't yet purchased a bed frame. I received a phone call from my equally bewildered brother who was in his room. I told him to call my dad while I called the police. It has now been almost four years, and I can assure you that all of my street smarts have markedly improved. So for context, I grew up in the suburbs, and outside of the occasional play park or sports field, there was really nothing to do. Me and my neighbors used to play knock and run, or its other name, Ding Dong Ditch. For context, I have a sister who's a year younger than me, and my neighbor James was the same age as me. His older sister was 14 at the time, and she also played with us from time to time. Although, I think she just wanted to hang out with my sister, whom she thought was cute. 
I was admittedly the biggest coward in the group. And to this day, my flight instinct is significantly stronger than my fight instinct. So I would never ring the doorbell, as I would always find a way to wiggle out of it. I always found watching it far more entertaining than doing it. On this particular afternoon, my cousins came over. One of my cousins was my age. The other was a few years younger than me and couldn't play with us. And the other was a year older than me. But everyone treated him like he was an adult, even though he was only 11. Or at least, that's how I perceived it. Let's call this cousin Daniel, as he's somewhat important to the story. I'm not a reliable narrator, and it's been almost 10 years since these events, but I'll really try my hardest to remember them. Anyways, my cousins came over, and we were banished outside to play. So we all decided that knock and run was a good idea. We usually just played around our immediate street, never venturing further than the next street over, out of fear of getting lost in the copied and pasted suburban streets. We made our way up the street to the play park on the top of the hill. It sat where a house could have been, and someone could have cut across it onto the next road. As we sat on the play equipment, we decided that a vote should decide who knocked first. And of course, I was picked. I remember getting myself out of it, and getting my older cousin to take my place. I'm very thankful that he was and is as proud as he is. It helped me get out of a lot of situations. We decided that our first target would be the fanciest looking house in the area. A white marble house with a fountain in the front yard and a curved driveway. I remember sitting next to a car. I was small enough to look under it from the curb and I had a clear view of my cousin sneaking up to the door and ringing the doorbell three times in order to get the attention of whoever was inside and he then bolted down the pathway towards the street to hide behind the cars. But before he got to the fence, an older looking man in a black leather apron with what I assumed was paint came sprinting after him. I immediately knew something was wrong. This wasn't the usual response to a knock and run. Sure, we've encountered some angry people before, but this was something very different. He practically flew down the walkway right towards Daniel and then threw his hand out to grab him. This didn't really feel like anything someone his age could do, and it scared the hell out of me. I think I might have been the only one with a clear view of what was going on, which meant that I was the first to see what was happening. It wasn't until the man was practically right on top of Daniel that he noticed that he was being chased, and the scream he made when he realized it will always stick with me. As I said at the start of this, Daniel was and still is a very proud person who will always try to prove himself. So hearing this scream of pure terror really struck me at my core. Everyone was clued in at this point as to what was happening. Daniel didn't open the waist-high gate at the end of the path, he just jumped it. Which I think ultimately saved him from getting hurt, as the old man had to take a second to open it. Daniel was sprinting down the street as fast as I've ever seen him. Stop, you little shit! The man then shouted with a deep, angry voice, which did actually stop Daniel in his tracks. They were both standing in the middle of the road at this point, reminding me of an old western movie when two cowboys would be standing at either end of the main road. The man marched straight up into Daniel's face, and I could finally get a good look at him. His skin resembled rough leather, and a few strands of hair on his head had long since grayed. He was clean-shaven and was wearing white pants, a white button-up, and a black leather apron that had what I rationalized as red paint on it. After he was maybe half a foot away from Daniel, he started to berate him, and I could only make out the words, There's sick people in there. Everything about this man threw me off, and I could see my neighbor and my other cousin who was hiding in the bushes felt the same way. My neighbor's older sister, who I'll call Tay, screamed out at him from the other side of the road, which then gave Daniel the opportunity to run as fast as he could away from this man. Then the rest of us started running at that point as well. I don't think I or anyone else knew where we were running off to, but I found myself in the car park of the shopping center right across the road from me. I waited there for maybe about 30 minutes, just watching cars come in and out, feeling safer with the large group of people. 
I had no idea at the time if he had chased one of us, but I knew that I was safe. I made my way back to my house, and I found that I was the last one to return. My cousin Daniel had ran straight home, and Tay followed him. My other cousin and neighbor ran around the suburbs for a bit before deciding to go home. My mom was missing when I got home, and I realized that she had been told what happened. My mother is someone who isn't afraid of protecting her own, and she's one of the strongest people I know. So I felt pretty safe that she was aware and was off telling him to fuck off. But when she got back, she seemed off. She didn't want to talk about what happened or really anything, and any color from her face had been completely drained. We ended up sleeping at my neighbor's house that night because my mom wanted to talk to my dad about something serious, and I think we all knew what it was about. Nothing else had happened for a while after that. Not for a while, but my mom was a lot more protective of what we did outside. We were no longer allowed to play knock and run or go up the road without a parent. It really bugged my sister who loved to play outside, but I just don't think she fully understood what happened. I have a lot more stories about this guy, and I'll probably write more because this has really helped me get a better grip on everything that happened throughout that year. But I hope you all enjoy the very first event in one of the worst periods of my life. This happened a couple of years ago. I'm a 26 year old female and I was walking my dog named Indy in my local field. It was dark but it wasn't late and it was winter time in the UK so maybe about 6 p.m. The field is mainly used for rugby and football but is completely free to walk through whatever. It's also surrounded by houses and streetlights on the roads but the field itself is dark so I had brought a torch with me, mainly so I didn't trot in any dog shit. I had come in one entrance of the field, and I'm following a path that leads to another exit and entrance. I used the field to make a loop back onto the road and then back to my house, giving my dog some off lead time whilst in the field. Anyways, as I'm walking up the field, I noticed a figure walking the exit slash entrance that I was going to use to leave. I keep my eye on this figure as they have very darn clothing on and their hood up. I'm shining my torch as I'm walking, so I know this person knows that I'm there as it's very obvious. At first, I wasn't that nervous, more so being vigilant. Indy is a wonderful German Shepherd, so as you can imagine, I feel pretty safe with her. It wasn't until I saw the person dug down behind a bush and tree that I then absolutely froze. I also want to mention that there's a lot of new trees and bushes planted sporadically up the part of the field that isn't used for sports. Anyway, I was about 200 feet from the exit, but I would have to walk past the bush that they hid behind to get to it. I call Indy over, and I get her back on the lead so she's close. By this point, she's also hyper alert due to the person behind the bush. With that, I hear a weird high-pitched voice that sounded like they were saying my dog's name. I assumed they heard me call her. They said it like three to four times in this long out high-pitched voice. It's clearly coming from the person hiding in the bush. Luckily for me, Indy wasn't reacting to it, as it probably barely sounded like her name to her. I had a small moment of shall I fight or flight. Either I won, run past the bush and try to make it for the exit. Two, turn around and run back into the dark field and make for the other exit, which is a lot further away. Or three, confront this motherfucker. Andy at this point just hackles up, ears up, and very alert in front of me, all while still maintaining a wonderful sense of calm. I went with number three. I confronted the motherfucker. I mustered up every bit of courage and confidence I had and then shouted at the top of my voice, what the fuck are you doing? The hooded man then came out from the bush very quickly without even saying anything. And I said the same thing again. What the fuck are you doing trying to scare a young woman? What the hell's the matter with you? I'm so glad that my voice didn't shake or break when I said it, as I really was terrified at this point. 
The man started to stutter and then said, Oh, sorry. I thought you were someone I knew. I then answered back with, Yeah? Well, who the fuck hides from someone they think they know in a dark field? After that happened, he apologized a couple of times and continued to skulk down the rest of the field, and I made for a swift exit with Indy. God only knows what his intentions were. Maybe he thought I had a smaller dog and was going to try and attack me. Maybe he saw Indy and realized that there was no chance. Or maybe he really did think I was someone he knew. Whatever it was, it was really weird and scary. I'm in university right now, but I'm staying with my parents at their house for the summer. I was hanging out with one of my friends and we decided to go to a party. I met this guy around my age. We were talking and having some fun, but was nothing too serious, or so I thought. We then exchanged phone numbers. We hung out a couple of times, but he became incredibly clingy right from the start. So I decided to distance myself in the hope that he would get the hint and back off. Well, he didn't. When I stopped responding, he sent me over 100 messages, with each message becoming increasingly more aggressive as time went on. Keep in mind, it had been less than two weeks since we first met. I finally responded, and I told him he needed to chill out. He appeared to calm down a bit after I responded, but then he asked for a phone call. I agreed, and we talked for a while. He told me that he couldn't stop thinking about me, that I was the best thing that ever happened to him. Just a bunch of stuff that is way too intense to say to someone you barely know. I tried to let him down gently, reminding him that I was only home for the summer and I wasn't really looking for anything serious beyond a flink. But this only made him angrier. He started yelling at me, insulting me, and calling me a slut. Basically a complete 180 from what he had been saying mere minutes ago. Then all of a sudden, the phone went silent. After a pause, he then said in a quiet voice, Bitch, you had better get ready, because I'm coming over for you. And he hung up the phone. This was very frightening because he knew that my parents were out of town for the week, and that I was staying at their house all alone. However, he didn't know where my parents' house was because I was always the one driving, and he didn't know my friend either, so I thought that he had no way of figuring it out since again, I'm normally living at school in another state. Regardless, I locked all of the doors and shut the blinds just in case. After a while, maybe an hour or so, I fell asleep. When I woke up, I looked at my phone and I saw a notification on my lock screen. It was from the Ring app, indicating there had been movement on my parents' camera. It was him. If you watch the video that should be on screen now, you can clearly see something in his hand. When he notices the camera, however, he laughed. I immediately blocked him on everything and reported the incident. I have no idea what he planned to do once he got there. It was terrifying to realize that he had come over when I was asleep and defenseless and completely unaware of his presence. As I would later find out, he was able to get my address from my phone number. Apparently, he googled it and it returned my dad's name as the owner of the phone number, along with my parents' address. Since I'm on my parents' phone plan, I guess it shows up that I still live here. This revelation was fucking horrifying, as I never knew my phone number could reveal my home address. I'm still extremely upset that this kind of private information is on the internet for anyone to find, as it's incredibly dangerous that websites would just give away this info to anyone. Please learn from my mistakes, and don't give anyone your phone number unless you truly trust them. I found out that you can get a free Google voice number to text and call people, and that that number can be traced back to you so easily. My advice is to use a disposable number for anyone you're talking to that you meet informally or online. I still can't sleep properly at night. Hopefully this never happens to anyone else. So this happened years ago when I was a dumb teen girl who loved walking the city alone after dark. This took place in Eastern Europe for context. 
It happened in a city with a tramway system. On this one night, I sat in a tram station waiting to catch the last tram home. Three trams stopped at this station, two of which went to where I was going. Important info for later. It was around 10 p.m., and as I sat there waiting, lost in thought, I barely registered a man quietly walking up and standing by the shelter. I thought nothing of it, just someone else waiting for the tram, until I started feeling weird. The streets were quiet and dark, and there was no one else in sight, just me and this guy. And I started wondering why he chose to stand this close to me when he had so much space to avoid dealing with people. I couldn't comprehend anyone wanting to socialize this late at night, given that I was not very social myself. So I glanced at him, trying not to overthink it. He was a bald-headed, beady-eyed giant, tall and built like a bear, big belly, and big arms and legs, whereas I was five foot two and scrawny. But that wasn't what scared me. It was the fact that he was staring right at me, unblinking and expressionless, not even attempting to look away or act embarrassed. No, this guy wanted me to feel uncomfortable. I instantly felt weak and shaky, cold shivers down my spine. This was not normal. I realized very quickly that I was not in a good situation. I could have missed the last tram, Walking home was out of the question, and my phone was almost dead. I was a shy kid, and I didn't have what it takes to scare this guy away. I knew that, but I had to at least try. I only managed to utter a small, I, trying my best to startle him out of whatever he was thinking. But my attempt failed in the face of his silent, threatening aura. He kept staring, no sign of intent to reply. He was enjoying this. Feeling the panic rising inside me, I told myself to stay calm and think rationally. Maybe he didn't hear me. Minutes had passed, and his stare continued to burn on my skin. There was also no tram in sight. Ignoring him didn't work. So I mustered up the courage to speak once again, but this time louder. What do you want? Stop staring! No answer. He definitely heard me this time. I felt myself start to get angry. I didn't want to let this guy get to me anymore. I didn't want to continue to give him the satisfaction of watching me squirm nervously and also pretend that his behavior didn't bother me. I took a deep breath and I forced myself to start thinking. I knew what I can't do. I can't fight him off if he makes a move and there's nothing I can say or do that will get him to stop. I didn't know what his intentions were, but I knew that they weren't good. If I tried to walk away, he would probably follow. I could run, but he would most likely catch up to me before I can tire him out, since his legs were much stronger than mine. Even if I managed to somehow lose him, walking home through dark alleys past the junkies and gypsies that were always prowling about could land me in an even worse situation. I could pretend to call someone, but he might feel compelled to act much sooner if he felt threatened. So what can I do? The only thing that I could realistically be able to do was try and outsmart him somehow. So I started developing a few plans, depending on which trams it showed up. Trying to confirm whether he was just amusing himself and actually waiting for a tram too, or popped over for other, more suspicious reasons and whether I could actually get any kind of help. I couldn't let him see where I lived, so if he followed me, I'd have to be prepared to employ whatever strategy available. And for that, I needed to stay rational and very aware of my surroundings. While I was still thinking, the first tram showed up. It was one that I could have taken home, but this one pulled into the depot right in my neighborhood, forcing me to lead him to my home. I hoped he would board it and leave me be, but he didn't. He kept watching me carefully. I let the tram go, desperately hoping it wasn't the last one to head home. He continued to watch, and I sensed that he was quite happy with how things were going. I put up with it for another 15 minutes, trying to focus on another plan of action. I could now pretend that I needed the other tram, 
the one going to a different area of the city, and just ride to the next station, then getting off as soon as possible, so I don't end up too far and miss the tram that I need. This tram showed up next. With my heart in my throat, I boarded it and sat down by the door. He got on it too, but set himself in the back pretty far from where I was. I let out a sigh of relief, thinking that this might still go well. When the tram then reached the next station, I got up and out, not looking back and hoping it was all over. But when I stepped on the pavement and watched the tram drive away, I couldn't see him in it. I turned my head slowly and was terrified to see him walking towards me, looking slightly pissed off. He stopped just a few steps away and resumed his staring, this time with a clear hint of malice, still in silence. My vision blurred as I fought back tears of despair. He was not going to let me go. The helplessness I felt was unbearable, but I couldn't cry. I couldn't give up. I had to find a way. I had to get home tonight. The prospect of what might happen to me any time now if I didn't was becoming way too real. My head was full of unanswered questions, regrets, and horrible scenarios. I wanted so badly to not have to think anymore, to not have to fight back the tears and stay composed, but I knew this would be his cue to enact whatever fucked up plan he had in mind, and I couldn't let that happen. Then, I saw the final tram approach, the only one I could take now, and I got on as quickly as my trembling legs would allow me to do. When I was in, bright lights enveloping me. My mind snapped out of its nightmarish spiral of fear and allowed me a moment of clarity. I had three stops to figure this out. I sat down at the front and looked at the driver. He was a frail old man blissfully unaware of my distress. Getting the driver's attention was a no-go. We passed one stop. There was no one else waiting to climb aboard. I turned around fully expecting to see that psycho had followed me again but I didn't expect him to be sitting right behind me. He wasn't taking any chances. He was making sure that I wouldn't try anything like last time. I shot him a hateful glare, and I allowed my anger to overcome my fear. I stood up and purposefully walked over to another seat in the middle of the tram car. I wanted to make it clear that I won't put up with his bullshit any longer. He got up too and slowly walked up to a spot two seats behind me and diagonally from me, then sat down with the tiniest arrogant grin on his face. Already expecting it, I shot up and stood by the middle door instead, determined to keep him on his toes. If I stood right by the door, he wouldn't have any idea which station I planned to get off at. He remained where he was this time, convinced that I was bluffing. After all, this really was the last tram, there was nothing else I could possibly do to escape now. He must have reckoned. So my defiance was just a funny act to him. This was my chance. I had to take the risk. It had to work. There were three doors in the tram, and they all opened and closed at the same time, and they stayed open for around five seconds before closing again if no buttons were pressed or people detected on the threshold. The next stop... The only one left before mine came into view. The tram slowed to a stop. The doors opened. I made no move. Five long seconds passed, and the door started to close. I bolted out and ran for it, reaching the back door as fast as I could and slamming the button to open it again, my whole body tense with adrenaline. I waited a long, painful second and jumped back in, keeping my head low, holding my breath, and crouching behind the nearest seat. I shut my eyes tightly and exhaled slowly while thanking the gods that I didn't believe in for that button working, and also wishing with all my might for him to not have seen me before I got back in. As I was waiting to hear his footsteps approaching, I pictured him frantically looking for me. Was he still on the tram? Face screwed up in anger? Head turning like a fat, ugly meerkat? Or was he catching his breath on the pavement of the last station, mad eyes searching the darkness for me? As the tram continued its loud journey, banging and clanging in sync with my heartbeat, I dared smile to myself, 
just imagining his face when he realized he fucked up. Hand on my chest, I did my best to stealthily look around the corner and found no one looking back. I then stood up in absolute excitement, throwing myself at the foggy back window. There he was, standing alone and victimless on that slow fading out of sight station, watching me leave him and his vile plans behind. Giving someone the middle finger never felt so good. I made it home and I told no one my story for fear I'd be admonished for my naivety, but I was safe and I was proud of myself. I definitely learned my lesson. Creepy stranger, I hope the events of that day taught you not to underestimate girls, as well as prevented you from becoming a criminal for the rest of your life. This happened when my best friend was 17 and a half, and I was 17 in 1996. My best friend Chrissy and I are both smaller females. She was 5 foot 4 and at the time weighed 110 pounds, but was a soccer player and very athletic and strong. I'm 5 foot 7 and at the time I weighed 125 pounds. We're both blue-eyed blondes and were often asked if we were sisters or cousins. There's a large reservoir on the outskirts of her town surrounded by a beautiful public park. We figured we'd be fine to walk around in the park because lots of people go hiking there. I had gotten some really good quality weed and we were looking forward to finding a peaceful place to smoke some out in the nature. I had my pipe ready in my pocket and we were stoked. We chose to go out on a Saturday. It was a beautiful sunny day and there were not many people there. We parked our car by the reservoir in the mostly vacant lot that had two other cars. We did not see anybody there when we got there. We walked around the water for a bit and then chose a trail to go up. It was about 80 degrees out and we were sweating but we had some water in my small day pack. As we got about a quarter mile or so into the trail, I started having a weird feeling. I then looked at her and quietly asked, Hey, do you feel something is off here? Everything is just really quiet. When there were usually crickets chirping and frogs singing, it was totally silent. She looked at me and said, Yeah, I think so. And then we heard some crackling of leaves about 60 foot behind us and a bit to the left. We didn't see anybody there at the time, so we just continued forward. We were both getting pretty nervous, and we heard the crackling again this time but a little bit closer. We still didn't see anyone there. Each time we would continue forward, we would hear footsteps a little bit more behind us. I thought we were being stalked. There was a turn off to the left which led to a clearing by a large rock about 12 foot high with a large sturdy rope anchored on it to climb up to the top. It was part of a steep hillside off the cliff. The rope to climb it was anchored to the ground as well, so no one can move it. I told her, we need to get up that rock now, we need high ground. She nodded and went up first with me right behind her. We flew up that rock, clinging to the rope tightly and going as fast as we could. When we reached the top, we turned around to see an older man probably about 45 with a slider build and he was wearing a jacket, jeans and glasses coming into the clearing. He was about 20 feet away. He looked at us with a cold vacant expression. I got goosebumps looking at him. I shouted, Hi, will you please leave us alone? We're trying to have some privacy here. He made no response, and with a blank expression, slowly started walking towards the rope which led to the top of the rock. My friend at this point was really scared, and then asked, What do we do? I saw a large rock about 8 inches and almost square to my right, so I grabbed it. I was really surprised at how heavy it was, but my adrenaline was going, so I lifted it easily. I told her, look around for the biggest rocks you can find and fast, move them next to us, hold the biggest one, and if that guy tries to come up we'll throw them at him 
and then hit him as hard as we can. Aim for his head. Fortunately, there was a pile of sizable rocks behind us to the left, like someone had made a ring to hold up a fire on top of the rock and then moved them away. She brought a few over and held a large one to herself. My friend and I stood close to the edge of the rock, holding our makeshift weapons. I looked down to the base of the rock where the guy was considering the rope. He looked at us again with very cold blue eyes and no expression. Then he reached his hand for the rope. I shouted loudly, Do not come up here! If you try to come up here, you're going to get really hurt. We're aiming for your head with these rocks. Now get the fuck away from us! I held the rock close to my chest so he could see it. My friend next to me was doing the exact same thing, and we had a pile of more rocks as well. He blinked his eyes and cocked his head a little bit, then released his hand from the rope, and then silently backed away. He backed to the edge of the clearing, through the brush, still watching us, and then we heard his crunching footsteps go back through the woods until we couldn't hear him anymore. We stayed on the rock for another 20 minutes, maybe a bit more, just watching and waiting. There was no other way to access the rock except for the steep hillside covered with poison oak, so we didn't think he'd try it, and plus we'd be able to hear him if he did. After we didn't hear anything for 20 minutes, we decided to make a break for her car. We threw several rocks down to the ground. Mine hit the dirt with a particularly satisfying thud. Chrissy went down first, while I was keeping watch just in case he came back. When I was scaling down the rock, she was holding a rock getting ready to throw it full force if he returned. Fortunately, he did not. We each grabbed the largest rock we could carry, put a few smaller ones in our pocket for good measure, then we headed back to her car on the trail, very carefully and quietly. The crickets were chirping again, but we were still extremely cautious. We made it back to her car without incident and quickly left. That was the last time I've ever hiked in that park. Allusions to suicide, death threats, and harmful language. Do not listen to this if it could upset you. It's very NSFW. This happened back in 2019 to 2021 and it still sticks with me today. I will be using fake names for myself and the man that I'm talking about. Mary for me, Dennis for him. When I was 13, I met someone on Discord. He was funny, smart, and exactly my type. He was also 16. I don't know my logic with that being okay at 13, but I was stupid and naive, and we became close friends. After about three months of knowing him, I told him I had feelings for him. We then ended up dating. We lived across country from each other, and we were basically just friends, but whatever. So as we're dating, he starts basically grooming me. As a kid who was always on the internet and was also exposed to kick, I was used to this behavior, and I thought it was fine. He had me send nude photos, gross messages, and pretty much worship him. I wasn't allowed to talk to people on Discord without him there, and stuff like that. He told me that he would kill himself if I ever left, or how he was always on drugs because he was so sad. He was also incredibly racist, and he thought Nazi jokes were okay. I'm so mad at myself for not realizing that it wasn't okay back then. He ended up cheating on me with his ex and tossed me out the door. He doesn't talk to me anymore, and he says we shouldn't talk anymore because we aren't together. Here's where it gets bad. Note, this happened over five years ago, and I have a spotty memory of this time. New accounts pop up in the server we met on and start saying horrible things about me. It was on a server of a mutual friends. Mary's a fat whale. Mary's an N-word, and more things of the sort. The accounts have names like Jerry Touches Kids, or Big Fat Will, etc. I'd gotten in trouble with the server owners because it was my fault that people were saying these things, like I had told them to spam these things about me or something. 
The accounts also started messaging me to kill myself, die, how I'm a whale and a whore and more. I ended up blocking every account and moved on with my life. Great, it was over with, or so I thought it was. Fast forward a year later to summer of 2019. Everything starts up again. The messages, him telling people lies and rumors and direct threats. I was sent to unsolicited porn, death threats, slurs, and how I should kill myself because no one cares. At that time, I had undiagnosed depression and anxiety, and I almost did kill myself. I went to therapy and tried to get over it. In 2020, right when the quarantine happened, I got a boyfriend. I was super happy and came back out of my shell. He and I would play games on Discord together, and I joined more servers. Around two months later, I got another message. Someone had messaged me named Lily, I believe. It was a normal profile, and we were in a server together, so I thought nothing of it. She then had messaged me how I was, and I had never talked to her before, so I was kind of confused. She said we had a long conversation about mental health the day before, so she wanted to make sure I was alright. I asked who she was and what she was talking about, and she said something like, Oh, you told me about this. You said you take medicine for schizophrenia and you must have missed a dose. Are you off your meds? I was extremely confused and scared because I had never talked to this person and certainly didn't have schizophrenia. After about 10 minutes of this charade, I realized it was Dennis. I blocked the account and didn't accept new friend requests. The next day, I got hundreds of messages with the same contents that I previously mentioned. The threats, horn, and much more. I was so terrified, and I had asked my boyfriend for help. He told me to make a new account and to not friend any of the other mutual friends so he couldn't find me. I did, which cost an affiliated Twitch account that I had spent years building. I changed all of my accounts, deleted most, and made new ones. The messages found me yet again. I had no idea how. These new accounts weren't tied to me. I got fed up and I had asked a mutual friend that I thought I could trust some personal information about Dennis so that I could go to the police and possibly get a restraining order or something. I didn't totally know how the police handled these issues. Months go by and nothing until the fall of 2021, in which Dennis messages me calling me a stupid bitch and how he'll always find me, how I'm so fat and dumb and no one loves me. I completely isolated myself and deleted more accounts. I was never able to go to the police because I had no information, like his full name or address. It's been two years, and every day I worry if he lives near me if he knows where I live or where I go to school. I recently found out that he had a website and he made YouTube videos. He's made YouTube videos referencing me in 2022. His actual copyright claim is something like, Marry the Fat Whale Incorporated. I can't find it anymore, so I put the closest to what I remembered. It was hell, and I'm still worried every day that he will find me. I believe he has a Reddit account as well and can find this. I really hope we don't meet again, Dennis. I wish you the absolute worst in your life. So for context, I moved into my new house about a year or two ago. I had lived in the area for a year before, but we were evicted due to the owners of our old house wanting to move in. I'm a young female still living with my family, which makes the story even more weird and pedo -y. When you look out my window, you see my fence and then a house. They're up on a small hill, so the fence doesn't block anything. The first encounter I had with this man in question was late at night. I was with some friends while all of our parents were at a party. I will say that me and my friends are old enough to be left at home. We were responsible. We were just relaxing in my room with no light and music on. We had turned off the TV when we were alone. 
We had heard my dog barking for a good 10 minutes. We passed this off because she barks at absolutely everything. I'm talking birds on the power line, bug on the front porch, anything that moves pretty much. We started hearing weird noises, like crunching circling the perimeter of my room and scratching on the walls. I kid you not, the moment we started getting scared, the loudest bangs I've ever heard start pounding on my glass sliding door. Me and the three others run out of my room to go look at what in the world could be making this much noise. We were then greeted by an aggressive dog. This dog was up on the glass pounding on the door. My own dog was scared. She usually doesn't do this, but she had backed away behind me into my room with all of her fur up. Then we see it. A man dressed in all black standing at the door. We were all just standing perfectly still, but I guess my friend's flight response went off, and just as he jumped to lock the door, the man reached for it too, to which my friend then yelled, What the fuck are you doing here? Who are you? The man actually responded with a very simple, I don't know, and then walked off with his dog, who was on a leash by the way. When our parents got back, we told them about him. They asked us why we didn't call them. Truthfully, I know we should have, but I didn't want to run my mom's birthday. I feel like I've really learned from this. Two days later, my mom confronted our neighbor who was mowing the lawn. He said that it was in fact him, and that his dog had run into our gate, and he had to get the dog back. He said that he had meant to come and talk to her earlier about it, but didn't. I thought it was a normal story, until I thought back to that night. The gate that his dog supposedly ran through has a tough clasp that was shut on that night. We have it there so our dog can't get out, and also so that nothing can come in, but you can open it by hand, meaning that this man opened the gate and let himself and his dog right into our yard. My theory is that he had heard the music stop and didn't see lights from his house. So he decided that he was going to come and, I don't know, rob us, I guess. The noises that we heard must have been him scaling the perimeter of my room for 10 minutes before attempting to enter. We filed a police report and nothing happened for a few months until one night. I was in bed almost asleep but still getting comfy. I sat up to rearrange my pillows and turned around so I could properly make it comfy when I then saw a face right outside my window staring back at me. Whoever it was was wearing a black face covering, and I texted my mom and just froze. I heard moving, and then my mom came and checked it out, but there was nothing there. This wasn't just my imagination, as my neighbor's lights were visible from the crack in my curtain, but the face was covering a majority of that light. Ever since that night, I've always noticed them watching. And whenever I catch them looking, they get up from their balcony and leave. I'll catch them in the same spot watching only five minutes later. So to the dear neighbor who watches me relentlessly, stay the fuck away from me. I'm a 30 year old transgender male. For the sake of my demeanor when this event occurred, I was a timid 19-year-old lesbian unleaded into the world immediately after graduation. I just lost my job at McDonald's due to a massive flood taking out a lot of businesses in my area, and I had a girlfriend that lived about 30 minutes away, and I needed gas money. So I took a job offered to me by a family friend at a 24-7 gas station in the next town over from mine. The shift I was hired for was 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., and I had never worked a night shift in my life, but I thought it would be pretty cool to have little to no pressure other than making sure coffee was ready at 4 a.m. for the morning regulars. I was required to train on day shift for the first couple of weeks to get accustomed to the operations. Throughout those weeks, I learned many of the ins and outs of what takes place on night shift, and I also learned the ins and outs of the people that hung around the place for hours, and there were quite a few. One woman in particular, Melinda, would come in every morning before and after dropping her kids off at school, also around lunchtime and sometimes actually buying us lunch, 
And during the evenings when her husband was home, she also came for hours, considering that she lived a couple streets over. She was nice, and I started to really enjoy her visits, and we got along so well in the store. It was a fun atmosphere for the most part. So it's finally time for me to work the night shift, and I had my manager with me for a few nights. I was taking her place on night shift because she couldn't do it anymore. She was nice, and I admit I had a pretty big crush on her, so I didn't mind spending time with her all night. And I learned when she worked the night shift, Melinda spent the entire night there. I had been working night shift alone for a couple of weeks, and some of those night shifts drug me into the days when we were short-staffed. But again, I needed the money. Anyway, one night I was doing my chores scrubbing the hot dog rollers and mopping the entire store. While emptying my mop bucket, I had heard the chime of the door, and I looked at my watch and saw it was 2 a.m., which was odd. There typically wasn't anyone coming into the store until 4 a.m. consistently, and I was a little upset because I had literally just mopped that floor, but I went out to see who it was. Just as I headed out, the movement in the mirror overhead to stop shoplifters caught my eye. There was a man at the counter doing something with the money order machine, and upon looking again, he had a knife. He was cutting the wires. For one reason, I have no clue. While he was cutting, I had heard him muttering, Where's Bonka? Over and over again. I knew I could walk back and get to the phone in the office, but I didn't want him to hear me. So I just pulled out my phone and texted Melinda to call the cops, and I tried to text quickly as much of what I could describe. She told me she would be right down, and I was freaking out with every second that passed. Before she could get there, the man went outside to the gas pumps and threw all of the trash cans, and he started to try and cut through the gas lines. I took this opportunity to lock the front door just in case he tried to step back in, and thank God I did, because he immediately made a beeline to the door, then slammed his fist into it. Just as he did, the cops and Melinda then showed up, and he was put into the cop car while I explained everything that had just happened. Turns out, Bonka was the name he called my manager, whose name was actually Bianca. He had become obsessed with her the weeks prior, dropping in nightly and making her night very uncomfortable, which explains why she couldn't take it anymore. They knowingly threw a timid 19-year-old into this mess, and seeing me there instead of her was what turned his obsession into rage. So, to the man that became extremely unhinged when they took a woman out of a potentially dangerous situation, and to the women that threw a naive teenager into his world. I could go my whole life without seeing any of you ever again. Fuck all of you. During my sophomore year in high school, I was unfortunately involved in a school shooting. It happened during lunchtime, and I'll never forget the chaos that unfolded in front of me. Right before the bell rang, I had heard what sounded like someone slamming lockers as hard as they could. The noise echoing through the halls, and before anyone could think, a kid ran down the hall screaming, He has a gun! Now mind you, it was close to the end of the year, so sadly, a lot of us actually thought it was just a fucked up senior prank. The reason I say this is because over the past few months, we had kids apparently posting on Facebook that they were going to shoot at the school. Therefore, we had police officers in our classrooms guarding us non-stop throughout the second semester. So when it actually happened, we really didn't know if it was real or fake. Our security guard, who was previously a sniper in the military, ran down the hallway to see what was happening. Not even a minute later, he comes running back telling us to run. And we did. Kids were jumping over tables. They were jumping over each other, and teachers were trying to pull kids into the classrooms. All hell broke loose the moment we realized this meant life or death. And all I could think about was, where's my sister? She had left for the bathroom moments before the first shots rang out. And I remember not knowing what to do. Do I find her or do I hide because the gunman was coming right for me? So I ran. I ran as fast as I could up the stairs and into my fourth period class. 
The teacher had sent a student out to see what was going on, and I rushed us both inside telling him to lock the door. I remember everyone staring at me, like what's going on? Are you okay? And that's when the principal got the intercom, and I'll never forget what he said. This is a code red, everyone. Hide your students. I repeat, this is not a drill. Hide your students. I didn't even have to say a word. The senior class I ran into took action. They barricaded the door with desks and chairs after pulling in as many students as they could. The teacher told us to turn off all of our phone sounds, but to text our parents. When I did, my mom so happened to be right around the corner from the school. She raced right over despite me telling her that it wasn't safe. I felt like I could have gotten my own mom killed that day, and I still regret it, though she remained safe. A lot of what happened after that is a blur. I remember my sister texting me that she was safe, but that the gunman was trying to get into their classroom. I remember hearing the SWAT team clearing the hallways and hearing one on their radios that there was multiple objects, but no one could be found. I remember seeing on multiple Snapchats teachers next to doors ready to take action. Some had scissors, others had bats, and another showed students taking off their shoes ready to attack anyone who entered without permission. Though being slightly wholesome, a school of people should never have to defend themselves against angry classmates with guns. That was something that should have never happened, especially on a day our guard was down. Long story short, we were in lockdown from 1.45 p.m. to about 10 p.m. that night. The shooters were never found, as far as I know anyways, and nobody was ever fatally injured, thank God. Walking out though to see food and paper scattering the hallways was rough. We had to have our hands up in the air as we left the school, and before going outside we were all patted down just to make sure we didn't have any weapons. My parents hugged me harder than ever before, and just being happy that we all walked out to see another day. I actually dropped out of high school shortly after that, and I moved back to my hometown five states away. I lived with my brother for a bit until I got my own place, and that's where I met Devin. He was like three years older than me, and I never realized that he was my first grade crush's older brother, but there we were. He was pretty good friends with my brother, and would hang out when we'd have kickbacks. Can't say he was a bad guy from what I saw, and he never had any beef with anyone. Super laid back stoner type guy. He was really cool. Until we all got drunk one night. And he let it slip that he almost shot up his high school. Now everyone there pretty much knew this about him. But just played it off as. Well he didn't actually do it so. I mean even my brother. I was disgusted when I told him what happened to me. And they dropped him from the friend group pretty fast. It's just really sad that it took me telling them that I was actually involved in it for them no longer to be friends with him. Like people, you shouldn't have been friends with him to begin with. What the fuck? Anyway, so I moved again, and I no longer talk to any of those friends, including my own brother, and that's something that I'm really not sorry for. It's been almost 10 years since these events, and I'm slowly moving on. I just really wish the trend of validating other people's very bad behavior would just stop. It's not a game, and if you ever feel the need to take these drastic actions, please don't. It's not worth ruining your life and others. You have a chance to make things right, so please do it. Thank you for all taking the time to listen to my story, and Devin, I'm more than okay if I never see you again. When I was 18 and newly graduated, I had ran into some issues with my attempts to enroll in college and also had a hard time finding a job in my area in the meantime, which led to me having to sign on at the job center. They determined that I was too shy to succeed in interviews and had placed me in a group that was supposed to teach interview skills in order to fix that. The group ended up ultimately being a complete waste of time. I honestly think they put me in the wrong group or just needed an extra member and made an excuse to throw me in to make up the numbers, but that's not really relevant to the story. And the other group members didn't too much to help with my shyness either, since they were all men who were at least four decades older than me 
and obviously didn't share any of my interests. Unfortunately, I ended up gaining the attention of one member that I wanted nothing to do with. I don't actually remember the man's name at this point, but I think it was something generic like John, so that's what I'll call him. John immediately got off on the wrong foot with the rest of the group when he interrupted the instructor during their introduction to the course to complain to him that being there was useless since he would be retiring in a few years anyways, and how no one wanted to hire someone who had spent over 10 years in prison. When that didn't get him the reaction he wanted, I assume the rest of the group thought he was just attention seeking, and the instructor had heard similar things before from people who weren't happy about being in the course. He waited until he had been given paperwork to complete, and then turned to the man next to him and loudly explained his prison sentence was for beating his ex-wife, but that she was a lying bitch and he never put a hand on her. She didn't even have any bruises on her at the trial or any evidence of the bruises or other injuries before that either. But because she was a woman, the judge automatically believed her and sent him to jail. This immediately set me on edge. I'm not an expert when it comes to the law, but I do watch true crime channels on YouTube, and I've never heard of a sentence of over 10 years for a single beating that supposedly never even happened and didn't leave visible injuries. Either John was lying and had been severely beating his wife to the point of putting her in the hospital, or he had been arrested on other charges and was simply covering up what he actually went to prison for. I immediately decided that I wanted nothing to do with him, regardless of which one it was, and I would avoid interacting with him as much as possible outside of polite hellos and passing him things if asked. Like I said before, I didn't really interact much with the other members of the group at all because of their ages. I attended the first half of the meeting in the morning, and I spent the dinner break in the library while all the men all snuck off to the pub, and then went home immediately after the second half was over. No one ever asked me how I had spent my breaks, and since the pub and the library were in the opposite directions from each other, and couldn't be seen from the front of the building the group met in because of the way the streets were arranged, there would have been no way for any of them to know where I had been, which made what happened next even more worrying. About halfway through the course, there was a day where I'd bumped into a friend on my dinner break and decided to put off visiting the library until the course was over for the day to try and catch up with them instead. When I did get around to it, I spent at least a quarter of an hour there before heading to the desk to check out my books, and I ended up being drawn into a conversation by the librarian, who had noticed I was checking out books related to a franchise he also enjoyed, and that was getting a new movie the next year. There were only a handful of other people in the library, so I didn't see anything wrong with talking to a friendly man around my age who had shared my interest after eight hours of boredom and paperwork. We had been talking for another quarter of an hour when he had suddenly glanced over my shoulder, looking confused and concerned, and was just opening his mouth to say something, when someone then grabbed me by my shoulders. My friends and family know that I hate having my shoulders touched without warning, and would never have done that to me. So I immediately knew that whoever was touching me was a stranger, and I knocked their hands away from me while turning around and then backing up into the librarian's desk. It was John. He was standing directly behind me with a huge smile on his face, and as soon as I turned around, he made a joke about knowing he would find me there, and how I practically lived there, before chattering at me as if we were close friends. I was just completely confused. It was obvious that he hadn't just coincidentally bumped into me from the way he was talking, but John had been kept behind while the group was heading out because he had filled out his paperwork incorrectly. And as I mentioned before, you can't see the library from the building, so he shouldn't have had any way of seeing where I had gone. It had also been half an hour since I left the building, so if he had left not long after me and just seen me go while we were walking the same direction, he would have come inside by then. The only way it made sense for him to know to look for me there, and also joke that I practically lived there, would be if he somehow learned I was going to the library during the dinner breaks, knowing that I hadn't that day and guessed I would go after the meeting instead. What made that even stranger than it already was is the fact that John had never shown any interest in me during the group sessions and mostly ignored me the way I ignored him, 
you know, unless we were forced to interact for whatever reason. So why was he now following me into the other buildings to start conversations out of nowhere and acting like we were so close? While John was still talking, the librarian leaned in to ask if I knew the man because he had obviously seen my negative reaction to being touched by John. And when I briefly explained the situation to him, he asked John politely to please leave me alone or leave the building. John refused and he tried to tell the men that we were friends, completely ignoring the fact that I had just said that we weren't and how ridiculous it would be to claim an 18 year old girl and a 50 something, 60 something year old man were friends in the first place. When the librarian asked again and how Wright told him that harassing other customers wasn't acceptable and that he would be removed from the building if he refused to leave me alone, John then smiled and agreed to leave in a tone that you use when humoring a child before walking out and then very obviously stationing himself right outside the doors, waiting for me to leave too. The librarian was clearly concerned by this and had asked me for the full story of what was going on and I told him, including my suspicions that John had been following me around without my knowledge to know that I would be there in the first place. He then suggested that I should stay in the library until his break so he could walk me to my bus stop just to make sure John left me alone, but it would be several hours, and if I had waited, I wouldn't have gotten home in time to change and head to another meeting that I had later that evening. So he asked me to at least come in the next time I was there just to let him know I was safe and reluctantly watched me leave. John immediately stepped into my personal space when I got outside, jokingly asking what the librarian's problem was and still acting like we were friends. I tried to walk around him without answering and just head to the bus station to go home, but he then grabbed my arm and reminded me that there was a closer stop for our bus. When I told him that we aren't getting on the same bus and I had never seen him on the same one as me, he then corrected me that we both needed this specific bus and told me where he lived, which was in fact on the same bus route as me. Although I was still tempted to walk away and go to the station instead and possibly sneakily get on a different bus and walk the rest of the way home, it was very clear he was going to follow me if I did because he still had hold of my arm refusing to let go when I tried to pull away, and there were also several dark alleys on the way that I had no intention of going anywhere near while in his company. When I agreed to the closer bus stop, he let go of me and started walking in my side, chattering away like we were good friends again. John kept walking when we reached the stop, which was odd, but I was hoping that my lack of response to anything he said had made him give up and decide to leave me alone or that he had mixed up that stop with one further along and I could run while his back was turned. No luck. As soon as he realized that I wasn't following him anymore, John came back, frowning as if he was confused and then asking me, I thought we were going for coffee together. Shocked, I told him bluntly no. He kept pushing, trying to convince me that I had agreed to go with him and when that didn't work, he switched tactics and he claimed that I had mentioned while leaving the classroom that I wanted some coffee, so he thought we could go together. That was an obvious lie too, since I don't drink coffee, and I told him so. John's only answer was to say that I didn't have to get coffee, and then kept pushing me to go to a cafe with him. I firmly told him no, and apparently he took that as me not wanting to drink in public because he attempted to invite me to his flat. And if that wasn't weird enough, he then started telling me if there was a naked girl on the couch when we get there, that I'm not to worry because that's his 18 year old daughter. Because an 18 year old is definitely going to lounge around naked on her father's furniture right in front of him, right? Other people at the stop were staring at us now, and I took that opportunity to point out that I was also an 18 year old, and firmly tell John that I don't want to go to his flat with him and to please leave me alone. He completely ignored the last part and he tried to claim that I was lying about my age and that I was at least 29 when most people at the time still mistook me for being in my early teens at first glance. The bus had arrived right at that moment and I got on as quickly as possible, thinking I would be safe there and that the driver would throw him off if need be. No. When I sat in an aisle seat to stop John sitting next to me, he physically shoved me across the seat, 
pinning me against the window to the point that I could barely move, and then pressing his knees up against the seat in front of him just to make sure I had no room to get past him unless he allowed it. The only way for me to get out would have involved me straddling his lap since the seats in front of us were occupied. I loudly told him to move and to leave me alone, but he ignored me and continued to try to convince me to come to his flat, and although a few people gave me uncomfortable looks, when I tried to make eye contact with some of the men in hopes they would help, they would look away as if they hadn't noticed or suddenly become very interested in their phones. I spent the ride huddled against the window trying to touch him as little as possible, and I was ignored yet again when I shouted at him to stop touching me because he kept putting his hand on my thigh as high up as he could without directly groping me. No one did anything about it, but he did stop touching me after that. He had apparently also given up on convincing me to go to his flat that day, but when we were coming up the apartment block, he pointed it out to me, physically turning my face when I refused to look. Then he told me his apartment number and actually tried to give me a kiss goodbye on the cheek which I dodged before getting off the bus and knocking on the opposite window to try and get my attention so he could wave at me. When the bus set off again, several people started loudly talking about how disgusting he was and that men like him should be reported, while refusing to look in my direction where I sat shaking and seething in my seat, and other than an awkward, hey, are you all right, from the driver, just as I was about to step off the bus, no one even bothered to check on me. As soon as I got home, I had actually sent an email to the instructor, telling her that I wanted to switch groups and never see that man again, explaining what he had done. She read it, but she pretty much ignored it for an entire week until I sent a follow-up, threatening to get the police involved if they ever forced me to interact with that man ever again, and their solution was to tell me that I could leave the course early instead, essentially kicking me out as if I was the problem. I bumped into the man not long afterwards, and he tried asking why I hadn't been attending the group anymore, admitting that he had asked the instructor and they refused to tell him, but I managed to get away and lose him in the crowd. I've seen him a few times in passing in the years since, but fortunately he's never noticed me or approached me again, and I hope it stays that way. I'm a 23-year-old female, and a few years back I was driving home after taking my dad to the airport for a late flight. It was already dark when I left the airport, and I still had a three-hour drive home. A few hours into the drive, I get recalculated to some windy back road highway. There were no cars or streetlights, and so it was a pretty dark and creepy road. As I turned a curve, I noticed a black car come out of nowhere and start to ride my bumper, then blue lights. The road was so dark then I had to drive for a minute to find a spot with at least a few small lights where I could pull over. The officer came up to my window and asked if I knew that my tags were expired. I thought it was kind of odd because I was driving my mom's car, and she's usually pretty on top of things like that, but it was more so the way he talked that made me uneasy. He was speaking pretty fast, like he was in a hurry or something. As he's standing in my window, before he even gets my license and registration, his radio beeps and he tells me that he has to go on another call. He practically runs back to the car and speeds off. I head back home, half worded out, half thanking God that I didn't get a ticket. I kind of brush it off until I go outside to my car the next day and find that my tags were not due to expire for two more months. It could have been a simple mistake, but I couldn't help recalling how weird the whole incident was. He could have misread the number, but looking back, I wonder what could have happened if he was someone with bad intentions. From then on, I only pull over in well-populated areas, and if a safe option is unavailable, I call 911 just to make them aware. So I'm sure I'm going to sound crazy here, but I'm super creeped out from a recent interaction at a grocery store. I was shopping with my toddler, and an older lady, maybe 70-ish, who was by herself had just came up and said, Ma'am, just so you know, 
All the canned veggies are in sale for 50 cents this week. And went on about how it's a great deal and they don't run it often. I just said thanks. I appreciate the heads up and I'll definitely go grab a few on my way out. She then begins to walk away and is almost out of sight. When she then stopped and looked back and then smiled at my son. She then asked how old he was. I told her that he was just over a year. And then she asked if he was my only child, along with some other random questions about him. Then she goes, Hey, I just remembered that I have some clothes in my trunk. All boy stuff in the 2T to 3T range, and had asked if I wanted it. I politely declined. I said that we'll be shopping a while, and I didn't want to hold her up. She then proceeds to say, Oh, it's no problem. I'll just wait outside and then I can come back in and find you before you leave. Are you a single mom? Do you need them? I got this gut feeling that something was off about this lady, and I just said nope, not a single mom, and we have all the clothes we need, and then I thanked her for the offer. She tried a few more times, saying things like, I just don't know what to do with them. If you could use them, I'd really be happy to give them all to you. At this point, it just really felt like she was trying to lure me and my son to her car. I continued to decline the offer and then walked away. I did a few more laps around the store looking for things I needed, and at one point I saw her standing in an aisle in the center of the store with a younger man, just people watching. I could just be super paranoid, and maybe she was just a sweet old lady trying to be nice. But something in me just told me to get out of the conversation as quickly as possible. I feel like parents will know that having a small child with you will make strangers talk to you all the time and also make small talk about your sweet kiddos. But this convo didn't feel the same as the others I've had while out and about with my son. Has anyone else had a similar experience? This happened when I was 10 years old. I was at a ski resort with my dad, stepmom, and three sisters. When this happened, my two sisters, dad, and stepmom were still out skiing, but me and my sister Ava got cold, so we went back to the hotel to go get some food. We had sat at the restaurant in the hotel until my stepmom came down. We asked her if she could hold the table so we could go up to the room quickly so that we could drop off our ski jackets. So we take the elevator, and once we get off, we start to walk to our room. That's when I then hear someone behind me then say, Hey! Keep in mind we're both about 11 at the time. I didn't think he was talking to us, so I just ignored it. We walked into our room, but before we can close the door, the man steps in the doorway. He was tall, probably about 6 foot, and he looked pretty old maybe about in his early 60s or late 50s, and he was wearing the hotel staff uniform, but just without the logos. The thing that raised a big red flag was that he was wearing black surgical gloves. He then says, Hey, I was talking to you. We then spin around, caught off guard. Ava then says, Um, us? To which he then says, Yeah, you guys. I was wondering if you could grab a pitcher for me and come into my room and pour some water for me. Our parents always told us to never trust strangers, and we already got a bad vibe from him, so we politely declined. His tone then got a bit annoyed, and he said, Come on, it'll only take a second. Can you please just pour me some water in my room? At this point, we already knew this wasn't right, so we said no yet again. The conversation went back and forth for about three minutes until he actually tried to walk into our room. Our instincts kicked in at this point, and I then ran towards the door and then said, Sir, we're good, and I then slammed the door on him. Ava and I sat in our hotel room for about ten minutes panicking on how we're going to leave to go talk to our parents because we had left our phones downstairs. We looked out at the peephole, and he was gone. So we bolted down the hallway and ran back down the stairs to the restaurant. Once we told our stepmom, she was mortified and she went to office security. 
they had interviewed us and they had asked for his description because they didn't have any cameras in the hallway. We gave them the description and they told us that nobody with the description worked there and that most of them were young broke college students. It was at this point that it really set in that if we had accepted and helped this man, we might have died. So please everyone, teach your kids about stranger danger. And to the creepy hotel guy that didn't actually even work there, I pray and hope that we never encounter you again. This is a story of someone I knew and it cut ties with because he was a fucking psycho. The first half will be to add context as to why I cut him off, and the second half is what makes it a let's not meet. I don't know if he uses Reddit, so I'll omit ages and locations. It started about four years ago when I was living at a friend's house while attending a nearby university. It was myself, my friend, his sister, and their parents. Roughly about two weeks into staying there, my friend's sister had invited her boyfriend to live into the house too. And by all accounts, he was a pretty cool guy, at first. Very sociable and really full of great stories. We often sat around the table for drinks, or we talked about life while having a smoke out in the garden. Within the first month, however, as he started to get comfortable, cracks started to show in his veneer. He would rant about government conspiracy, how he was always a wronged party, how he was big into Sigma male bullshit and martial arts, and oh hell how he had a temper. He had this big dog that he always kept in the cage that was extremely violent when he wasn't around. The dog actually attacked his girlfriend and had to be put down. That's when the guilt trips towards her began, and the ranting became incessant. About two months later, he had the bright idea to live in a shipping container, mainly because the parents wanted him out and he had dragged his girlfriend along for the ride. This was a rented container in a storage yard among the outskirts of the town we were living in. He would intimidate and threaten the staff there constantly until they called the police. This of course was another conspiracy. He became increasingly abusive to his girlfriend to the point where the family got involved to get her out of there. I stuck close to them having to pretend to be on his side until we could safely get her out. They broke up, which he blamed me for, claiming that I was poisoning her against him to make her mine. She has a new partner now, and they're very happy. We all blocked the psycho ex on everything possible, but he continued to harass them until he eventually disappeared, or so we thought. Fast forward to last year, I started to receive messages over social media from several different accounts blocking each one in turn when I discovered who it was. Some friendly and some hostile. One of these profiles, however, was pretending to be someone that I knew from university. We talked about life and how things were going, and eventually I was invited to a house party, claiming it was a free house and plenty of people were coming. I booked the time off work, made my travel plans, and kept talking to this friend coming up to the date of the party. I mentioned it to my friend's sister, and she was interested in going herself, until I mentioned the address and she panicked. The address in question was a property belonging to the crazy ex's father that was scheduled for sale. I waited until the day of the party, and I called the police to check the property, claiming a suspected break-in. They found five people there, including the ex. Parked out in front was a butcher's van equipped with food storage and a collection of knives, hammers, and rope. Yeah, terrifying shit. This seems small in comparison to all the stories I've read on here, but I'm a 19-year-old female. My whole life I've lived on a small isolated road about 15 minutes away from the city. My parents built the house that my siblings and I have lived in our whole lives. I have three siblings, all of us being females. We have neighbors but aren't too close together like an urban community. One of our next door neighbors, let's call him Frank, has lived on his property about as long as my parents have. Growing up, I've always gotten a weird gut feeling from this man, and my mom has always told me to listen to it. I've never been alone with him and I never plan on it. 
He lives alone. He had a girlfriend when I was around 10 years old, and he had a dog who sadly passed away a few years back. My older sister and I would go over to his house and spy on him through a small hole in his barn when we were younger. Tons of pornography was hung up all over his barn. Growing up, he showed up to our house whenever we would have a bonfire or any event where he could hear people having fun. Always unwelcome, and it's obvious no one wants him there, but he would still never leave. His excuse for this behavior is being drunk. Around June, I had a graduation party at my house for graduating high school. It was absolutely perfect, and I was surrounded by all of my loved ones. While things were wrapping up and people started heading home, Frank continued to stay. Quite usual for how he is, but nonetheless frustrating. We began to have fun, and it got to a point where the only adults there were my parents and Frank. My mom had went inside to go to bed, and my dad was beginning to get tired, and kept hinting to Frank that he should be heading home soon. Frank just said, All right, man. He then proceeded to pull out a chair and sit, and watch us all play cup pong while staring at miners' asses. My older sister went up to my dad and expressed how uncomfortable it had made her. You know, how he was staring at a bunch of miners' asses. My dad is not a confrontational man, but always made sure that we feel safe and comfortable, and he will be confrontational when the time comes. My dad then told Frank that he needed to leave immediately. Frank refused, then saying, I think I'll stay here and watch over the kids while you go to bed. That right there sets us all off. One of my friends then starts yelling at Frank, telling him he needs to leave, and that it's not okay for him to be here. And after we asked him multiple times to go, he eventually leaves. But ever since then, he's been making extremely gross and inappropriate comments to my dad about how attractive my younger sister is, who's only 17. My dad has confronted him multiple times, and he will not change this behavior, and will still come over after being told to stay on his property. Whenever I leave my house to go anywhere, especially at night, Frank always watches me through his window. It just freaks me out. He gives us all such a weird creepy gut feeling, and nothing we do to confront him seems to work out. He's done a lot of weird things like this all throughout my childhood, but it's been at an all-time high recently. If anyone has any ideas on how to stop this, please leave it in the comments. I was 10 years old when Steve came to work for my dad. He was one of the guys from the neighborhood. It was 1980, and everyone knew each other. We all came from two large neighborhoods that were divided by a single street, so most of us, particularly the older kids, all hung out and partied together. Things back in the 80s were a lot different than now. Things were more lax, to say the least. For example, in my household and most of my friends' households, you were allowed to swear just as long as it wasn't directed towards anyone. This information will become relevant to this story. One day it was summer, 1981, and Steve needed a ride from a job site that he was working at for my dad. My stepmom and I were tasked with going to get him and take him home. Well, to say that I had a little crush on Steve would have been an understatement, and as we're driving him back home, I decided to act all grown up and begin swearing, just putting it in normal conversation. So when we finally get to his house, he turns to my stepmother and then asks, You're gonna let her talk like that? To which she responded back with, It's just words, Stevie. There's no malice behind it. I remember him looking at me with a look that I'd never seen before. Hate. That's the only word I can use to describe it. And as he's looking at me like that, he then says, That's a foul little girl. And steps out of the car. As soon as the door closed, she then looked at me and said, I don't want you alone with him ever. I was a bit confused, but I did understand because of the look he had given me. Well, time goes by, and it's now roughly 1989. I'm about 18 or 19 at this point, 
and I'm hanging out with some friends from the neighborhood when our local paper, the Oakland Press, shows up. So my one friend wants to look at the ads for a job and then grabs the paper. Well, right on the front page, in a column to the right side of the paper, is the headline, Oakland County Serial Rapist Strikes Again, and there's a composite sketch. My friend starts laughing and holding up the paper, stating, Look, it looks like Stevie. Well, sure as shit, it does look like Steve. But there's no way, right? He's so put together, smart, a talented artist, and he has a job and a beautiful girlfriend. There's no way that's him, and we all just brush it aside. Well, during the same time frame, myself and some of the other girls in the two neighborhoods start noticing movement outside our windows at night. We all just think it's the boys in the neighborhoods just being boys, and brush it off. That is, until my stepsister wakes up in the middle of the night to go use the restroom, and she then sees a man's face pressed up to the bedroom window. She starts screaming, and we all rush into her bedroom. My dad takes off outside to go look. But of course, he's long gone by then. My dad comes back in and starts asking her questions. Did you see who it was? Did you recognize him? Which direction did he run to? She said that she had no idea who it was, but that it was a grown man with dark blonde hair. That she was sure of. For some reason, though, we didn't call the cops. We all weirdly just kind of brushed it off. Even my stepsister, after a couple of days, was totally over it. And then more time goes by. It's now roughly 1994, and I'm upstairs in my bedroom when I hear the front door then bust open and my friend Lyle comes rushing in. Julie, Julie, my friend says. What? I'm up here. What the hell, Lyle? Did you hear? Stevie's been arrested for rape, Lyle says. They're saying he's the Oakland County rapist. No fucking way. I respond back as we're just staring at one another in shock. He then starts telling me what happened. To give some context, every Friday night, a guy named Red would hold a poker party that the older crowd would attend. So Stevie shows up one day and says to Red, Hey, if the cops come around asking questions about me, tell them I'm here by 8 on Fridays. Cool? Red was like, No problem thinking it had to do with those guys selling weed. And sure enough, the cops do show up asking questions. But it's not cops, it's detectives. And once they semi-enlightened Red as to why they were there, Red told them the truth. The truth being that Steve didn't show up most Friday nights until at least 11 o'clock to midnight. As it turns out, Stevie was using Red's poker party as his alibi, not only to the cops, but also to his girlfriend, too. He would tell her that he was going to Reds for the night to play, but was really using our local community college on those Friday nights as his hunting grounds. And the crazy thing, too, was that I was actually attending that same community college at the time. It was surrounded by woods, and they would tell us to walk in pairs or ask security to walk us to our cars. He was ambushing the girls, hitting them in the head, then dragging them into the woods to beat and rape them. One had actually been discovered by security laying naked and unconscious in the bank parking lot. She had managed to crawl her way out of the woods after the attack before losing consciousness. When he finally went to trial, he was convicted on over 20 counts of rape. He was actually quoted saying to the police, I'm really glad you caught me when you did, because beating and raping them wasn't doing it for me anymore. The judge said, and I'm quoting her, we're very lucky we apprehended this man when we did. He was on the verge of becoming a serial killer. And his poor girlfriend. He would steal jewelry off of his victims and then give it to her as gifts, enabling him to secretly relive his horrendous acts every time she'd wear one of the items. It's been almost 30 years since he was convicted and sent to prison. And as far as I know, he's actually still alive. I've always wondered if I would have been his first killing. Criminologists always say that their first killing is usually close to home. He hated me so much, so I always just wondered. 
And the scary thing is, I would have willingly went with him if he'd shown up at our door saying for me to come with him. I wouldn't have given it a second thought. It just goes to show you that you never really know anyone. We all thought we knew Steve and his character. Turns out none of us really knew him at all. Warning, the story is extremely dark and graphic. It mentions rape, incest, murder, physical abuse, abuse of the elderly, child abuse, and pedophilia as well. Here we go. I'm a female, and I'm now an adult, and thinking about what I'm about to tell you just really creeps me out. I had an uncle who I'll refer to as Jay. Jay was like 50 when I was about 6, so he seemed so ancient to me. He had gray hair and was very overweight with a serious soda addiction. I was never allowed to be alone with him, but I only learned this as an older teenager. Jay lived with my grandma on my mom's mother's side. I hope that isn't too wordy. My great granddad had passed away when I was 6 years old and Jay announced to all of us he would be living with my great-grandma to keep her company. I don't want to sound shady because I honestly don't judge people living with their parents, but, well, Jay only stayed there to be a mooch. He was obsessed with a sport called bowls, and he went to a bowls club and spent a lot of time in the pub afterwards. He didn't have a job, and I never heard of a story of him ever having one, to be honest. I can't remember what age I was, but I have a vivid memory of Jay talking about a secluded forest that he liked playing in when he was a kid, apparently. I say apparently because my grand later told me that he had never even played on this path as a child. Anyways, he basically grinned at me in a creepy manner, and he told me he'd love to walk me up that path. Now, as I've said, I was never alone with Jay, so this never happened. But in hindsight, this incident sticks in my mind and creeps me out. I have a distant cousin who I'll call S. I found out when I was a teenager that Jay had groomed S when she was a kid. When she was 15 years old, they were caught having sex. Obviously, this was rape, but the family member who caught them didn't even bother telling anyone. Years later, S told the family what happened and that Jay had convinced her it was normal and that they were in a relationship. It's so sick and twisted. This is why that comment about him taking me into the forest with him makes me so uncomfortable to this day. It felt creepy at the time for some reason, and I honestly think he had sinister intentions. When I was like 12, my grandma got very ill. She had become more isolated over the years, and my gran had struggled to keep in touch with her because Jay always said she was asleep. Well, when she ended up taking ill, I can't remember exactly what was wrong with her. I remember in the hospital she had so many bruises, and she seemed afraid of Jay. When he was out of the room one time, she told my gran and her other siblings that Jay had been stealing money from her. She had told my gran to check a specific area in the house that had a stash of money that she'd hid from Jay, but when my gran went and checked, the money was all gone. Jay must have somehow found it. Every time she was released from the hospital, her bruises had healed, but they always appeared when she was home again. One time, her own wedding ring was missing, and her finger was broken. It was as if someone had forcibly removed it and literally broke her fucking finger. It was really disturbing, and my gran was convinced Jay was definitely up to something. One time, she ended up in a hospital because she had fallen out of bed. I remember the doctors were very suspicious about this, but nothing ever came of it. My grand later told me that the way my great grandma had fallen, it was like someone had pushed her out of the bed. It was really scary. The only person who could have done that was Jay. Eventually, my great grandma passed away, and I remember being at her house in the aftermath while everyone sorted through her things. My grand later told me that she found a bunch of pills in Jay's room and in the bathroom medicine cabinet too. She was convinced that Jay was drugging my grandma, but we can't prove this. 
It seemed like any time my grand tried to call her, she was asleep, and she's convinced Jay was behind all of it. So much of her money was missing too, as well as priceless jewelry. One day when I wasn't there, my grand said she went into Jay's room and his bed sheet was literally shredded. It had a huge hole in the center and it had shit stains all over it, including on the mattress. There was also a sticky substance. Yeah, it's exactly what you suspect, but it was all crusty and dried in. I'm so sorry for that mental image, but I have to explain it. I didn't find out about this until I was 21, because obviously I was too young beforehand. My grand had also told me that she suspected Jay did something extremely dark to my great-grandma. She suspected that he harmed her in a sexual manner. Out of respect for my great-grandma, I can't bring myself to explain why this was suspected, but sadly, it is possible. Obviously, none of this can ever be proven, but it's so sickening if it's true. My grand also suspected that Jay contributed to my great-grandma's demise. She's convinced that he was drugging her for some reason, as well as stealing money and pushing her right out of the bed. She's also convinced that he stole her wedding ring and physically harmed her. It was also clear that he wasn't feeding her, and she was so weak she couldn't feed herself. My grand visited with LJ being there once towards the end, and she offered to make my great-grandma some food. My grand told me that she was extremely thankful, which struck her as odd. Then she told my grand that Jay only made her sandwiches sometimes. She wouldn't answer my grand whenever she probed for more information, and when my grand made her a full meal to eat. My great-grandma ate like she had never been fed before, which further disturbed my grand. The wedding ring was never found, and Jay claimed that he had absolutely no idea what happened. He also took my great-grandma's ashes and threw them away without telling anyone, and he insisted she be cremated quickly too. Her death was kind of strange because she was ill, but the doctors didn't really know what with. She was just so weak for seemingly no reason. I have a memory of us being in my great-grandma's house, and Jay was sitting on the couch, and my grand had her back to us doing something. I remember seeing Jay's open laptop, and he was on a porn site. I knew what porn was at that age, but I obviously shouldn't be seeing it. Also, it's really fucked up that he had that on with his sister and a kid in the same room as him. His mom was dead, and he sat there with porn on? Really? It was so fucked up, and it's so creepy looking back. Honestly, he had the screen tilted as if he wanted me to see, which only freaks me out even more now. I'm so glad my family never left me alone with that man. I just know something terrible would have happened. I really believe he would have hurt me if he could. He's a very sick and disturbed weirdo. I remember he stared at me, looking at me noticing the porn. He actually giggled and grinned at me with his tongue out. It freaked me out. My grand had her back to us, so she wasn't paying attention, and I was honestly scared to say anything. My grand would have probably broke his neck if she saw, so I remember turning my head away really fast and just closing my eyes. I told my grand that I didn't feel well, and I asked if we could go into another room to look through some of the other things, which we did. I just wanted to get away from Jay, and thankfully, he didn't follow us. I assume he was just too busy watching porn in the living room, which is just unhinged to me. A huge family brawl happened on my grand side, and she and her siblings all had a huge fight with Jay over everything. They confronted him after the Ashes fiasco, and he denied everything. My grand actually accused him of murder and abuse, but he denied all of it. This was also right around the time that S came forward with what Jay did to her but I wasn't made aware of it until I was older. Everyone was disgusted, and Jay was completely disowned by everyone in the family. The family member who caught Jay and didn't say anything wasn't disowned though, which I really hate, but that's a story for another day. Word on the street is that Jay now has cancer, but we aren't sure if that's true. 
One of Jay's best friends disowned him completely after learning of all his antics, alleged and proven. It was found out that Jay was stealing money from his little sports club, and he was also giving money to cam girls online. He apparently had a feederism fetish, and he targeted overweight women and gave them loads of money. My granddad made a comment about how he could give them money to eat, yet couldn't be bothered to feed his dying mother properly. It's so fucked up. He got some of these feederism ladies to date him, and I guess they're just as messed up as he is. One of them also died due to her lifestyle, and Jay didn't even attend her funeral. It just shows how he didn't give a shit about any of these women. He only saw them as a weird fetish thing instead of a human. I know those ladies were messed up too, but still, Jay just seems worse. My gran had someone tell her all this, and she listened for the gossip. But ultimately, she said that Jay deserves everything he gets. And I must say, I think I have to agree. It was 1999, and my parents had recently divorced, and my dad had a bad habit of dating some very questionable women, which he wasn't shy about inviting over. There was one woman in particular who stood out among the several bad eggs that he chose to spend time with. This woman happened to have a 13-year-old son, who she'd always bring with her to the party sessions hosted by my father. It was my dad's backwards way of hiring a proper babysitter for my five-year-old brother and I. This boy immediately made me uncomfortable, and as an extremely shy little girl, that's not surprising. But something about this boy really scared me, and my feelings went way beyond awkward childhood shyness. Turns out, my first impression of him couldn't have been more correct. My dad had a horrible habit of leaving my brother and I upstairs unattended while he partied with his friends and girlfriend downstairs, 90s biker style, drinking Budweiser. I say we were unattended, but the strange 13-year-old boy apparently counted as proper supervision. He was hardly a responsible party because he used to tie up my tiny wrists with scotch tape leaving me lying face down on my belly while he played Nintendo 64 with my brother. He did this many times, along with requests for a bag ride down the stairs. This request coupled with him holding a plastic lawn and leaf bag open as if I'd jump in so he could throw me down the stairs. Sometimes he'd hold a pencil to my neck whenever I was tied up, and he would actually whisper in my ear, If you move, I'll kill you. Luckily, my dad didn't see his mother for too long, but long enough for my interactions with her son to be plentiful and memorable. Well, after this duo were removed from our lives, my father's now ex-girlfriend left a dismembered baby doll and black roses in my dad's mailbox. FYI, the black roses were meant as a death wish. We never heard from them after that, at least that I know of. The real shock came many years after in 2005. So the boy who terrified me as a child was Aaron McDonald, then 19, who had helped Hannah Stone and Spencer Krempitz kill Barbara Kame, a 41-year-old registered nurse in August 2005. Barbara the victim was Hannah's mother. Spencer and Hannah were young lovers, and Hannah's mother didn't approve. So Aaron and Spencer abducted Barbara from her apartment tied her up, and they then took her to a cornfield where Spencer shot her in the back of the head while she was tied up. Aaron apparently decided to be part of this horrific crime for a promise of only $400. I can't help but think he took great pleasure in being part of sadistically tying her up and killing her, an escalation of what he did to me. Hannah was sentenced to 55 years in prison for the murder, plus 30 years for conspiracy to commit murder and 15 years for criminal confinement while armed with a deadly weapon. Her boyfriend Spencer pled guilty to the murder and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Aaron pled guilty and was sentenced to 62 years for murder, 10 years for criminal confinement, and 30 years for conspiracy to commit murder. Aaron is now dead. He died July 2020 of an overdose of heroin and fentanyl in prison. And sorry, but not sorry good riddance. 
he agreed to kill an innocent woman for a measly $400 and left me with a good dose of early trauma. Therefore, he won't get any sympathy from me. I grew up in the middle of nowhere Wyoming in a town of only 400 people. My father worked for the state and cared way more about his reputation than he ever did us kids. We lived in a three-story, two-car. Basically, everything looked perfect on the outside. My parents were extreme Catholics, so if we didn't read the Bible and say grace before our meals, mainly our mother would beat the ever-loving shit out of us. When my father would go to work, our so-called mother would transform into an animal. We weren't allowed to make noise or play down in the living room, and the rare occasion we would get to go play outside, she would be watching us from the window like a hawk behind the curtains. If we ever did anything she didn't approve of, she would come outside and either yank us inside or give us a death stare, waving us in and full-on punch us repeatedly in the back of the head. She would never hit us directly in the face so she wouldn't leave visible marks. One of the scariest times I can remember is when I was nine years old. She had forced me and my little brother, who was six, to watch while she beat my older sister while she was naked. My older sister's 14, by the way. It was absolutely terrifying as she repeatedly punched her in the ears and then yanked her around by the arm. After one of my sister's ears started to bleed, she grabbed her by the arm and then dragged her up the stairs. My little brother and I were literally frozen in fear, and I could barely breathe feeling cold sweat dripping down my face. We both broke our trance when we heard screams coming from my sister upstairs. I alone ran up the stairs and I slowly opened the door to my sister's room. My mom now had a white robe on with blood splattered all over it. My sister was literally bent over backwards on the top of a dresser, like ass up against the dresser bent over backwards, while my mom was putting pressure on her chest continuing to bend her backwards. My sister had lifted up her arm, whispering my name. I felt the blood drain from my face. Never in my life have I felt so afraid. Was I going to watch my mother kill my own sister? I thought to myself. I almost froze from fear yet again, but instead, I then ran down the stairs and out the back door. My grandma and aunt on my dad's side lived about three blocks away. This was also an extremely small town dirt roads and all. When I finally reached their home, I pounded on the door, begging them to answer, and they finally did. I was trying desperately to tell them what was happening, but the words kept coming out all jumbled from being out of breath and being so terrified. I was shaking, and I could barely think straight. They told me to calm down, and rather than calling the cops, they called my father, and they told him to come home immediately. They then drove me back to the house. Once we got there, my mother was reading my brother a book in the corner. My aunt told my mother what I had told her, but she said she had no idea what I was talking about and that my sister was at a friend's house. They all looked at me and told me I would be in very big trouble if I ever did this again. As soon as my aunt left, my mother picked me up with one hand, squeezing on my mouth and nose. Right then, we had heard my father pull up, and then my mom threw me to the ground. When my father came inside, she had then told him how I put on a big show, and how I was such a liar. My dad was furious with me, and he made me go to my room and read the Bible. He didn't even bother to check upstairs to see if my sister was really gone or not. He just stormed out of the house and went right back to work. My sister could barely walk, and didn't speak much for over a week and no one even seemed to notice, let alone care. There's much more that happened, but that's all I'll share for now. This all happened between 1994 to 2000. I personally haven't seen or spoken to my mother in the past 12 years, and for all I care, she can rot and die alone for what she did to us. I feel a sense of calm and relief typing this out. I'll share more of my childhood again very soon. It was a nightmare that I thought would never end. Because of all the trauma, I haven't seen my brother nor my sister in the last 12 years either. We all moved to different states once we became adults, 
and we barely even talk on the phone. At least none of us ever have to deal with that monster of a mother ever again. Hey everyone, that's about it for today's stories. If you have your own story that you would like to send, you can send it in at southerncannibal.com or you can email it at southerncannibalstories at gmail.com. I look forward to telling your story. Have a good night or good day, everyone. And remember, to always, stay.